hello everyone. You are more than welcome to this Open Table Network Q&A webinar. My name's Kieran and I have the privilege of being the Open Table Network Coordinator. So the Open Table Network is a growing partnership of Christian worship communities um, which welcome and affirm people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer or questioning, intersex and asexual, that's LGBTQIA for short, plus our families, friends and all our allies. The network has been created by and for LGBTQIA plus people because churches don't always feel safe and welcoming for us, but our name, Open Table, is an open invitation to come in just as you are and be with us in a safe, affirming community. So following the success of our recent Q&As with our patrons, which is still available on our YouTube channel, we've moved into a new format to have a dialogue around key issues that matter to us as LGBTQI plus Christians and allies. And this month, we're hosting a conversation between two Methodists about the recent votes on opening marriage to all couples on conversion therapy and gender neutral inclusive language at the Methodist conference in June. So our two panelists, Reverend Dr. Barbara Glasson, is former president of the British Methodist Conference and a patron of the Open Table Network. And she'll be in conversation with Reverend Mark Rowland, a founder member of Dignity and Worth, who works for LGBT plus equality in the Methodist Church. So you may remember that we did a Q&A with Barbara uh, a few months ago. Barbara is a pastoral theologian and former president of the Methodist Conference in Britain. In 2000, she founded Somewhere Else, an inclusive faith community in Liverpool, where people gather to bake bread and worship God. That's where I met Barbara. And there she met LGBT plus Christians and other groups she calls prophetic communities. Her book, The Exuberant Church, Listening to the Prophetic People of God, reflects on coming out as a spiritual experience and how the church too must come out. Barbara described the coming out process as both profoundly human and deeply of God. As she became president of the Methodist Conference in 2019, the Methodist Church approved a report called God in Love Unites Us, which proposed to allow churches to hold same-sex weddings. Covid restrictions delayed local churches voting on this report, so she was unable to see a final vote before she stepped down in July 2020. And Barbara now teaches pastoral theology at the Queen's Foundation for Ecumenical Theological Education in Birmingham. And Mark Rowland is a Methodist minister currently serving as a free church chaplain at the University of Warwick. He lives with his partner Sam, who's also a Methodist minister, and he's undertaking PhD studies exploring a queer theology of holiness. Mark is passionate about inclusion of LGBT plus people in the church, and while at Coventry Central Hall, where he hosted an open table event in 2017, he built up strong relationships with Coventry Pride and pioneered work on policies local Methodist churches could adopt around services following same-sex marriage and civil partnership. Mark is also a founder member of Dignity and Worth, which works for LGBT equality in the Methodist Church, speaking prominently for those concerns in the Methodist Conference. So now this is where I will disappear to moderate the chat and the questions and leave you to discuss. And I will come back uh, in about 30 to 40 minutes when we're, it's time to take questions from the audience. So I'll see you soon. So Mark, um, we've, uh, as a Methodist people, we've been making decisions at our conference, but I'm aware that not everybody knows what the heck a Methodist conference is, how Methodists make decisions and how we're, how we're formed as a church. I mean, we, we like to talk about ourselves being connectional with an X, um, but again, we're talking Methodist language. So maybe we should just unpack that bit and say how we make decisions and, and, and what the process is in that. And what, what, what is a president of conference as well? <laughs> uh, thanks, Barbara. I think that's a really great place to start as we um, think about all that's happened and where we are. So since the days of John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism, um, Methodists have met together to talk together um, about what to do and I mean his first questions for the very first Methodist conferences were about sort of what to do, what to preach um, and those were the basic questions and ever since then we Methodists have met annually in conference um, to talk about how we order our life together 
And the people who meet there are some ministers, some are lay people. Um, they're all elected mostly. There's a few exceptions to that. But basically, people are elected to be there from a variety of places. And we come together as Methodist people to say, how do we order our life together? Um, and basically, then that's done in conference. Um, usually, there'll be some kind of report prepared about an issue that a small group have worked on, um, thinking carefully about it. And all the people who come to conference, and some of those are very much um, ordinary church members in the pew can read that, will get up and say, well, I think this, and others will say, I think that. And ultimately, through its votes, the conference expresses its view on something. In the case of the recent decisions about marriage, we actually used a longer procedure where it came to conference one year, and then it was sent out for further discussions all around our connection, which is what we call our whole church, um, because we are connected to one another, um, and then came back Originally, it was supposed to come in 2020, but as we all know, COVID made lots of things not happen. Um, so it came in 2021. And sometimes conference debates, um, perhaps a bit like, like Parliament, if you ever watch Parliament on the television, can get a bit fraught. Um, sometimes they can be um, hard work. Um, but I think one thing I would say as someone who have been a member of conference for a number of years now, um, is the debates about this stuff about these marriage decisions um, and we'll later come on some of the others as well um, were marked by incredible grace and respect um, and I just want to pay tribute really to everyone who was part of them whatever their view was um, for that because I think that says something about who we are as Methodist people but part of the way that that all happens is that someone has to sit in the big red chair um, which is John Wesley's chair um, and preside over our debate. So they call people to speak. Um, they have to tell them to shut up in a really nice way if they're running over their time. Um, they have to guide the conference with a bit of help from people whispering in their ear um, through that. And Barbara, as Kieran said, was president of the conference in 2019, which is when we first considered the God in Love Unites Us report. And arguably it was the most tense consideration of it, because at that point, I think none of us had any idea what the outcome was going to be. Um, we didn't know it could fall. It could be on a night. It could be a Brexit 52, 48. Uh, it could pass overwhelmingly. And I think none of us came into that conference knowing really what it's going to feel like. So, Barbara, what was it like sitting in the big red chair? <laughs> Well, you have to understand that I'm only five foot two and it is a very large, big red chair. So I did feel um, that, that my feet were not touching the ground. Um, but um, I think it's a huge privilege to be in that position and to hold a, a debate to account and to be able to help people be heard, you know, whatever their opinions. I think um, we'd already set a tone, hadn't we, Mark, really, in the years before, that whatever our opinions were, we were going to try and be gracious, we were going to try and listen to each other, we were going to try and hold our contradictory convictions. Um, it was more important to stay together than to agree in some in some ways. And, um, and f although debates did get fraught in local synods at times, I think we were... We were glad when the report came back that the that the conversation had been well um, well held and well managed, and I, I think that was true of the conference. I mean, it, it was a long debate, wasn't it? it? Was hours and hours of talking. And you were in the chair all the way through, as I recall. I was, and and uh, and I can remember by the end I was so tired I couldn't think how to get the conference to vote at all. I couldn't remember what I was supposed to say. Um, but um, on the whole, it was a huge privilege to be able to to hold that and to to enable that conversation to happen, and and I was proud of the Methodist people in the way that they were able to hold that that debate well. And and I mean, a conference is about conferring, isn't it? It's about that that listening to each other and yeah, to talking with passion and talking uh, with conviction, but also being able to stand back and, and hear other people. So. I think we did that and I was proud of us for that. I mean, obviously. I agree with that. I mean, and I think and I think it's almost important to come back to that kind of Methodist understanding of conferring. This isn't just having a debate like we might have in some kind of debating society, but we see that as a means of grace. We very much believe that God is active in that conversation in the conference and that, you know, the, the tone there and the character of it is actually very much representative of God's presence in our midst. Yeah, definitely. And, and and I felt very much that we were surrounded by prayer in that on that occasion. That 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 well, I was very frightened about being in the big red chair. But when I looked out, I saw Methodists, you know, and I thought, actually, I know you. <laughs> 
you are the people that nurtured me in my faith and and are pragmatic people of god and and you know that sense of of being together even though we were disagreeing i think it's really core to our understanding of god's grace amongst us i that think was that's tangible, right wasn't it yeah. yeah, completely. And when we got, and in 2019, um, one of my abiding memories is we agreed that we would take a lot of votes as secret ballots, which we don't do a lot. And we were less technological then, so that meant paper ballots. So we took lots of the votes on paper. And when we got to the key one about whether we would move to adopting this situation where we would have two understandings of marriage, one that marriage can only be between a man and a woman, and one that marriage can be between any two persons, and we'd hold them in tension, respect each other, even though we don't disagree. It took ages to count those votes. And I was sitting there thinking, are they recounting? Have we lost it? Is it going to be Brexit kind of 52, 48? And that would almost be awful because, well, you know, well, we know how decisions like that turn out. Um, and then, you know, the, the chair of the business committee came up to read it out and it was an enormous vote in favour. I was, you know, I was stunned. And that really does stay with me as a moment of that 2019 conference. And then, of yeah. course, that had to go out around the synods and came back this last year. Yes, and I, I think although you and I were, you know, rejoicing at that decision and, and wanted to kind of applaud and jump up and down and shout hooray, there was a sort of holding of it, wasn't it? Because for some people that was a very, very painful decision. And for some of our more um, conservative colleagues, you know, they had to hold, they had to hold that within their own understanding in ways that were deeply painful um so and and some of the black led churches also had you know had to take conversations you know uh, to, to their home communions and so on so there was there was a sense of just holding that well uh which, which was which was challenging actually wasn't it i, I because i think was, that's right there was I mean, rejoicing it... and pain in the room at the same time uh, yeah, and I think that has continued all the way through to the confirmation of those decisions in, in the recent conference. And we continue with that pain, as particularly for, for some of those who find the decisions difficult as to how they carry that forward and, you know, what that means for their own ministry and for their own place in the church. Um, and I think we continue to live with that and try to hold that in care and in grace. Um, because the conversation wasn't just about um, gay marriage, was it? That was what the press picked up on. But <laughs> it was about human relationships in, in general. Uh, particularly key was the, the conversation about cohabitation. Our younger people had, had pushed us into thinking about that more closely. And um, that, that was also a, a really important part of, of the conversation that we had, wasn't it? Completely, yeah. And it's it, that has been a question that's been around for years. In fact, I know that some of the younger people who were part of originally asking for some work to be done on that um, uh, are quite a lot older people or by now married by the time that we got to actually making some decisions. But I think it's really important that actually we seek to deal with people's lives as they are um, and to be able to recognise God's grace in their lives as they are, um, not according to some idealised scheme. And actually for lots of people these days, living together before you're married is actually quite a normal part of life. There is um, just a practical reality for a lot of people around the cost of housing and things. Um, that means actually, how do we respond to this? And for a lot of time, it's just been something you just don't talk about. And probably for all of us in the LGBT community, as well as others, we you know actually once things become things you can't talk about, that is actually really can be negative and quite harmful. I mean, I have a wonderful story from uh, a former Anglican colleague of mine who had a couple come to see her about whether they could be married in church. And they were worried that they wouldn't be allowed to be married in church because they weren't yet living together. And they feared that the vicar would think they weren't taking their relationship seriously enough um, to be married in church. And for me, that was just a really wonderful illustration of actually how things have changed. And that this isn't necessarily about being casual, as some people have said, but actually about seeing relationships as serious stuff. And we actually have to take them seriously. And there was an interesting comment, wasn't there, um, about uh, a minister... Who, who was talking about elderly people that had, you know, maybe had a marriage that had, they, they were widowed or they'd been long time divorced and they, they were, um, they had a companion, if you like, um, but wanted to legitimize their sort of friendship in an older, older age and what, what that meant for them. Um, and so that was a different take as well, wasn't it? it, it which was quite, quite revealing yeah, I... really and important. Absolutely. And I think it's probably not 
doing the Methodist Church down to say we're probably a church of more older people than younger people. Um, and so I think that that pastry, that's just really important. And, you know, some people are in situations where if they married again, they'd lose part of their pension and all of that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it's a really, really live issue, I think, for many of our older members. There was also a discussion about conversion therapy, um, which, which came not as part of that main debate, but, but was raised, wasn't it? And felt really important for us to, you're talking about things that we don't talk about, <laughs> that might come in that sort of category as a rule, but, but it was put on the, on the table, you know, we need to talk about this, we need to have a, a decision on this. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I feel really proud of this one in a way, without blowing my own trumpet, in that Sam and I, Sam is my partner, also a founder member of Dignity and Worth, moved it as a memorial, which is a formal way of getting something on the table in the Methodist Church through our local Birmingham Synod to say we should, um, we need to say something as Methodist Church about conversion therapy. And I felt that was important for two reasons, really. One is I know Methodist siblings who have had the experience of it and have been through it and either at the hands of Methodists or others um, and bear the scars of that. And the other is, I, you know, there are some really loud voices around at the moment in the co national conversation about should the government ban conversion therapy, wanting exceptions, loopholes, get out clauses really for religious groups. And I felt it was really important that actually to have a large-ish religious group like the Methodist Church to say, you no, know, actually, we think it's important we do go ahead and ban conversion therapy. Um, and that, the, you know, there isn't one voice from this on the religious group saying don't do that or give us an exception for some things. Um, it seemed to me was to say something really important in the public square. Yeah, I mean, conversion is sort of a religious word, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and it's a very loaded, very, very loaded word. And it's a shame, really, that we we have to discuss this as being something that we would even contemplate doing. But clearly we do. and. Um, and so I think it was in, important to be honest and, and 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 to address, you know, where we are as a church on that, which came over very clearly, I, I felt. Yeah, I thought it was a really good response to say, you know, actually, we're against conversion therapy, methods shouldn't do it, we call on the government to ban it without further delay. It was really unambiguous, and I think that's a really positive statement um, that we've been able to make. And I think it says something, you know, something I'd come back to, um, sometimes in my own work is about being the person you needed when you were younger <laughs> you know and when I was yeah. first beginning to kind of wrestle a bit with my own sexuality I never went through conversion or anything, therapy or anything but I read stuff online about how you could choose what your sexuality was going to be and actually if I spent less time with that and more time with actually you know you're, you are who you are and that's okay <laughs> and you know and, and the thing of your life is actually um learning to be happy and comfortable with that and you know even out and proud um then actually you'll you know i think you'll have a happier life sooner and so you know the more it seems to me we can say actually no this isn't about changing who you are it's about recognizing god made you who you are and, and exulting in that um i think that's a gospel message yeah absolutely um i mean one of the things that i've written about um is that that the com coming out as as gay as who you are, whoever you are, <laughs> however you want to define yourself or name yourself, that process of coming out is um, something we recognise as a process of transformation. That that as we question who we are and discover who we are, then actually uh, we're living through a process that's transformative and life giving ultimately, and and. Um, Kieran and I wrote uh, quite a bit about that in relation to the coming out process and the church coming out, that that, that, that process of transformation needs to happen um, in church communities as well as we discover who we are. I think that in the time of COVID and being locked down and suddenly we couldn't be church like <laughs> we thought church was, has kind of provoked that conversation even further. And that be interesting to see how that develops for us, that that we're not who we think we are as a church and that we need to discover what how we're being transformed and changed and and i think the lgbtq communities you know you have that in your understanding of self that that the the, the coming out process is is something that um you know can even relate to an organization and and be prophetic to an organization it's interesting to see how that that can feed back into our self-understanding as church. 
think that's a really interesting set of things to um to ponder and that you know i think for me in some ways coming out is about becoming more fully who you always were in other ways it's a profound transformation especially as you relate differently to people who think they knew you one way um and i think yeah i mean we're all living into we the phrase new normal is becoming a bit of a cliche isn't it but um into that sense of actually yeah we are going to have well at one level we have to do things very differently at another level we have a great opportunity to do things very differently um and the world isn't the same as it was and i think there's a great honesty in coming and saying and actually this is who we are now we have been changed um by this and and i think this decision changes us i mean i don't know how what you think of the ways the decision itself transforms the the life of the church well i i I think often about that children's story about Chicken Licken. Do you know Chicken Licken? Who thought, who thought the sky was going to fall in? You know, um, and um, I, I think there's been a sense of, amongst some people, oh, you know, if we make this decision that the sky is going to fall in, the whole, uh, everything's going to fall, there'll be no church, there'll be no God, there'll be no gospel, there'll be no, it's like, um, and, and I've said to a number of people, really, the sky's not, falling in um you know we are people of faith that are traveling together and um i mean nobody is forced uh, to have gay marriages in their church if that's against their conscience <laughs> you know nobody nobody is forced as a as a church to to host gay marriages if if that's their decision um so we live we're living the this process you know uh, with love and grace really and the, and the sky is not this you know god god remains um and i think i think in in the dna of the methodist people is that sense of god's grace you know ahead of us and holding us and um and forgiving us and and calling us into new possibilities i think that's kind of in our in our heart and the sky the sky is not going to fall in god isn't going to sort of pick up sticks and shove off somewhere else <laughs> god is still in god's heaven and god is still with us and it sort of almost takes us back to those you know the uh, possibly apocryphal last words of john wesley the best of all is god is with us and yes. god is with us in this as much as god is with us in in anything else but yeah they're absolutely the, the, the sort of prophets of doom out there who want to say you know i mean we've seen them even you know if some of those have been following the online threads on some of the methodist pages um, you know, people saying, oh, well, this is the end of the Methodist Church, which is now on the road to hell and all of that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> and you think, well, no, life goes on. The world is still turning uh, and God is still gracious. Yes, I am. Um, I, I mean, as you know, I'm teaching at the Queen's Foundation and training Methodist and Anglican clergy currently and others. And um, the, I, I didn't see the student body for a whole year because I was locked in my attic teaching on Zoom. Uh, but I went to the leavers service. So I met them in person, you know, as they were leaving and going out into parishes and circuits. And there was a sense that, you know, this is a real Kairos moment is that, that they're, they're going in out, you know, to a church that is different and to, to a, a um, a different way of being uh, leaders within that and and i felt really i felt moved for them and encouraged by them in that you know that their their ministry would be very different from mine <laughs> and and in some ways different from yours mark and because the church is being transformed and and we are in a different place and that's that's a good thing um, yeah and i mean i think you know i'm really mindful that you know the church that I serve now isn't the church that I came into when I left college um, and it will change again. And, you know, God's work is creative and transforming and we should probably be more concerned if things stop changing, you know, much as I, you know, with the best of them, I can like things to say the same and know my place, which pew I sit in, but actually God's creative work does keep transforming us and calling us to transformation. Um, and if we see God at work, that's gonna be happening. Uh, the other thing is really, you know, this is a very small step along the way as well, isn't it? It would taken us, you know, best part of, I know, my lifetime to get <laughs> here. Um, and we feel like we've moved really slowly towards this decision and thank God we've made it. But there's lots more to be done and lots more to be um, understood about relationships and how how we understand gender and 
and sexuality differently. Um, so we're, we're still really at first base, I think, aren't we? Yeah, I think there's a huge way to go. And it's been really, I mean, one of the things I found sort of frustrating or even a bit annoying is the way that sexuality questions get set up as a kind of test, you know, of your fidelity to the gospel or the faith or any of those things. And I wonder almost, you know, it seems to me as we journey forward on this, how we actually get to a place where we see, you know, almost feel sometimes like you could believe what you like about the resurrection. Um, but if you're on one side of the marriage debate, then that says whether you're a Christian or not. Um, and I almost say, how do we kind of actually de-problematize those, those conversations so that actually we can recognize that sexuality is enormously diverse and varied. Um, and that's not just about um, LGBT identities, but just in terms of how we express ourselves as sexual beings, as human people. Um, and that that's, Christianity can have something to say about that because we believe that, God made all that is and that's part of it but it's not kind of for me the be all and end all of what makes a Christian. No absolutely not um, and I don't know why we've got so stuck um, in this particular conversation when as you say um, you know we have a variety of of understandings of doctrine of uh, of, of biblical uh, interpretation of, of um, all, many many other things but but this debate just got stuck didn't it uh, and became kind of magnified in ways that that are actually quite ridiculous um uh, when we think about our humanity you know there's much more said about um justice and uh, and peacemaking and um and uh, all all those ways ways of living a christian life that you know are not hooked on the gender sexuality conversation but are about what it means to be human in in the light of god's love yeah and i mean i really hope and i mean i think in one way the genius of the conference's decision in affirming these kind of two understandings of marriage i think for me does unlock that a little bit in that it says actually we recognize that there's a variety of views on this and we can live together and i've almost you know i've said it locally that almost isn't just about telling us we can do that it's offering us a vision of doing that and to say, yes. and that can be prophetic to the wider world that so often is divided, you know, are you one side of a given issue or the other side of it? And you can't relate if you are. And to say, actually, no, we can. And there's something profoundly Christian about that, I think, to say, you know, we're going to live together because actually the things that unite us are, are, are far, far greater and more important and wonderful than the things where we might take different views. Um but that's that's something we constantly have to live into because you know I, I'm I'm as susceptible as the next person to being like no no I'm right you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing is I mean is our relationship with ecumenical colleagues, isn't it? And and uh, where we are in relation to uh, particularly the the Church of England, the Anglican Communion, and and Roman Catholic um, colleagues, and how we sit within those ecumenical relationships, well. Um, I mean, you and I know as Methodists, um, if the if the Anglicans make a decision on something, then the, the headline is the church says such and such, <laughs> even if the Methodists haven't said that at all. Um, so we, we we kind of, um, we have to not be the poor relation, but often know that we are. Um, so so how, how we journey alongside ecumenical um, colleagues and, and hold, um, hold steady with them as well is, is you know it's a challenge for us isn't it yeah, and I think you know I think there's kind of respect and love at the root of how we do that to recognize you know there are already things that we don't we're not always on the same page about um, and yet I think we can you know as we try and do within our own community I think we can do across the denominations and I also would you know I think it's really interesting and increasingly becoming the case, and we were pointing this out to people as we came up to the conference, so the different churches in these islands have already taken different decisions, and the Methodist Church isn't on its own in this. So, you know, thinking of our Anglican siblings, the Scottish Episcopal Church already have marriage for same-sex couples. Um, and it was great to see the recent vote in the church in Wales about blessings. Uh, at least I thought that was great. Um, and while the official position of the Church of England doesn't show any sign of shifting anytime soon, I know there are countless people within the Church of England who are passionately committed to, to inclusive work, and of course many of whom host 
open table community which is brilliant um you know there's so much within that diversity that we can work with and our friends in the united reform church made a decision like we did not have so long ago and there are baptist churches registered for same-sex marriages um and you know even roman catholics there's quite a variety of of actual experience at local parish level you know and even when we disagree you know i think we can come back to but ultimately we're all seeking to follow follow jesus you know it sounds cliched at one level but i think there was actually something really profound there mm, yeah absolutely yeah yeah so where have we got to in our in our questions mark are we covering the bases <laughs> i think we are sort of i was going to say i'm going to kind of push it back to you we were kind of talking about um, um the gender neutral decision of because we've had a notice of motion passed and for those who are not clued into conference jargon that means a proposal that comes up from the floor of the conference um about being much more intentional about our language which we still most of our stuff still use either you know he to embrace he and she and actually to say well actually can we go even beyond that and say let's let's be much more careful about pronouns and gender neutral language and so talking to barbara as a patron of the open table network um we were actually started to went well actually patron that's quite a, a a gendered term um and actually it's amazing how many places it comes up in and we need just our eyes opening a bit um but more seriously on that, you can tell me what you're going to be called in the future, Barbara, but what do you think this decision actually means for the Open Table Network? About gender neutral language? Yeah, I, I mean, again, it's a debate that's been going on, you know, most of my, certainly most of my ministry. Um, and, you know, when I first went into circuit uh, as a probation minister, I was, everyone referred to me as a woman minister, you know, we have a new woman minister. Uh, uh, as uh, nobody ever referred to a man, you know, we have a man minister. When I became president of conference, um, the press uh, picked up on that. I was the third woman in a row. So like, why is that significant? You know, <laughs> surely to goodness, there's more remarkable things about me that I'm, than I'm just another woman. So it's deeply embedded, isn't it? This idea that we have to define somehow um, by, our, by our gendered identity. And... Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a quite a big unlearn for society. I mean, I, I was jokingly thinking I should be called the matron of the Open Table Network, but that does sound a bit like Hattie Jakes. Um, but, you know, finding general neut neutral language is it's quite challenging because we don't always have the vocabulary um, to do that. And and again, it's about how. Um, members of open table and other lgbtqi networks can can feed that understanding back into the church and help us um i mean the bible doesn't use gender neutral language for a start does it you know so so we, we, we've got a lot to unpick and unlearn um, and i think it's like you were saying earlier in some ways in so many of these ways we're kind of at first base yeah. you know and we're beginning to have our eyes open to there's a whole set of stuff we need to engage with and that's going to be about transforming ourselves and transforming our churches and our communities um you know and for me and that's about us discovering more of what god has to show us um you know that's not about you know because it's so often characterized as oh we've got to make ourselves politically correct or whatever and no, i think it's about us journeying more deeply into the truth of god and how we how we enact that in how we order our lives and yeah we've got I've got loads to learn and unlearn. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm interested in your studies and about, you know, how, how we, we queer the church and how, how, how we move away from that binary sort of debate of I, you're either this or that. Um, and uh, I, I'm intrigued by, you know, where, where, your, <laughs> where your PhD is taking you with that one so far. That could be a really long answer. Um, but I think one of the things I'm doing at the moment is actually diving back into actually the origins of our Methodist movement and to see actually how controversial Wesley was at the time. And, you know, I was reading a track this last week where someone was accusing him of being against nature, corrupting children, destroying the family, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you think this all sounds terribly familiar. Um, and you think, actually, you know, and I've coined in my in my thesis this kind of term methodizing. Uh, 
which is and suggested this is what Wesley was up to and he was creating this Methodist movement which kind of in some ways took the existing Christianity he'd been given and everyone knew and in other ways radically transformed it and I think when we kind of come to queer the church we're actually doing something very much akin to what Wesley was doing all those years ago that you know we're saying this inheritance of the faith is as much um, an inheritance for uh, um, queer folks for LGBTQIA plus folks as it is for anyone else um, and we can receive that and also we radically transform it and for me that's the constant making of the gospel that actually if we start looking at church history we've seen time and time again um, and I think so what we do is so we almost we rediscover that heart of it of you know which for me we find in things like the fact that we're made in God's image um, and that you know God's grace at work in us leads us to do more than we could ever imagine um, and some of these things for me are the outworking of that. Yeah I, I think Wesley was also bringing us to the idea that it, our experience was was valid mm. and that it was part of, of what informed the decisions that we made so it wasn't mm. simply about doctrine and or tradition or the bible but that experience however he framed that experience was was part of the conversation and and as our experience um, is understood more broadly that, then that again is a legitimate way of, of of making decisions or informing our decisions absolutely there's a bit in his journal i love just before the famous account of his um conversion experience on may 24th 1738 where he talks about wrestling with a particular text of scripture and he won't take the interpretation that seems to be the most apparent it doesn't square with his experience and he says that that can't be right until i kind of have you know until i can actually back that up and experience and then the major 24th experience becomes that backup of his experience but he has this kind of thing of yeah but until actually i can kind of verify that in terms of real life it can't be right and i think yeah i think that's hugely mm. powerful for me i see kieran's back with us yeah <laughs> hello um, kieran I, it feels like you could uh cheerfully uh go on uh uh, discussing for hours but we do have a good number of um, audience questions so I'd like to introduce those so the first couple are about inclusive language and scripture so um, Rebecca asks um, is gendered language being also being considered in how we talk about and address God um, or was the the vote at conference exp exp you know specifically around you know talking about people and conference processes so is it broader than that the uh, vote at conference was explicitly around people and how we talk about people um and that's the nature actually of because it came <laughs> up as notice of motion that's a proposal from the floor so it's it's not something that you know something that comes by report can consider a whole broader range of things whereas when you bring something up from the floor you've got to be quite focused on what you're doing um, that said um the Methodist Church does have a report from years ago on, um, I forget, I'm going to forget the title of it now, but basically calling the church to be more expansive in its use of imagery and language about God, which I think was passed in the 90s, which for my money, we still have a huge amount of work to do living into that because you know, if you turn up in an average Methodist church on a Sunday morning, the language you hear used for God will be overwhelmingly masculine. Um, and, you know, when we put God, our father and our mother in the worship book in 1999, that was controversial. And the Daily Mail or Express, I forget which now, you know, had a fit about it and it was on the telly. And we haven't really, I don't think, I don't know what Barbara's take is on this, but for my money, we haven't really gone much beyond that yet. And I think it's really important we actually get moving on that. Well, I, yeah, I think there's different practices, isn't there? I mean, I think you're right. In, in your average Methodist chapel on Sunday morning, you know you've got gender you've got you've got a male god haven't you um whereas i mean teaching pastoral theology teaching theology at queens uh, that's not tolerated at all so it will be challenged in every essay you know why are you calling god he you know use, use inclusive language why why are you using gendered language you know it's it's kind of drummed into students that that's not the way forward so i suppose change will come Mm. It's it's just I suppose partly more elderly congregations, although not wanting to excuse that, mm. but um, and pa and partly, uh, yeah, it fil filtering through, um, in in ways that that are kind of educating. It's something that we encourage uh, churches which wish to host open table communities to be mindful of. Um, 
in 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 the choice of uh, worship materials and and music and so on. So um, that's it's really good that the Methodist Church did produce a resource that might be uh, an inspiration to others. Uh, that's um, perhaps I'll uh, look out the link to that and share it. Um, so thinking about um, the Bible again. Um, Cole asks, do you think the traditional Methodist church is too lenient with those who use the Bible as an argument against change? I'm, I'm interested as to, to what we mean by the traditional Methodist church here. In some ways, I think we let people get away with lazy hermeneutics. And I find that really frustrating. And, you know, I've, and the kind of thing that says, actually, in official Methodist church policy, for example, uh, we've allowed the remarriage of people who've been previously divorced for years now. Um, and if you take a literalist interpretation of scripture, then, well, Jesus calls that adultery. Um, and yet we recognise actually there's a pastoral reality here that says we need a more nuanced and careful treatment of, of texts like that. And I think that's right. Uh, and yet we seem to sort of tolerate um, a simplistic reading of probably the text many of you will be familiar with. Um, the language of lenient almost seems to take us towards sort of punishment, and I would want to stay away from that. But I think there is a constant need to kind of be in a process of education. Um, and this is the thing I kind of keep trying to do to say, this is how I read scripture. And this is for me a, a conversation about reading scripture. Tell me about how you read scripture. Um, and so more, it's kind of, I just want to challenge people more and ask questions more and say, you know, and as some will point out, you know, if you want to cite Leviticus, you know, man shall not lie with a man as with a woman. Well, the penalty there is death. So if you want to take the first bit literally, are you also saying you want to take the second bit literally? Um, also, you know, and yet often it's the case, well, we don't want to take the second bit literally. We do want to kind of take the first bit literally. And what's going on in our interpretation there? And I just want to be more challenging, I think, of people. Um, not to say they can't hold their views, but actually let's really ground those. And, and actually, if that's not coming so straightforwardly from scripture, let's be upfront and honest about that. Yeah, I think also, um, I mean, we've said already, we're a connectional church, which means that we're not led by a hierarchy, central hierarchy. I mean, the conference makes decisions, but but the church is the people, the church is the church, wherever, wherever it happens to be. And so there is a sense in which the challenge has to come from local people amongst local congregations. And that means we need to help people be confident enough in, in, in the ways in which they understand scripture and are able to challenge. And I think in my lifetime, I think in the 1960s, particularly, the church lost confidence in that. You know, if we started questioning scripture, then everybody was going to leave and that would be terrible and the sky would fall in. In actual fact, uh, we we um, didn't enable people to to be critical about the Bible. I mean, positively critical about the Bible in those days. Um, so it's been easier for some people just to drop back into sort of imagined certainties rather than do the work. And 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 we need to help people to be educated to do the work and and to not be not be frightened about being critical about biblical text because actually that makes it hugely exciting and interesting uh, when we can challenge it and and again you know that's not going to stop god being god um we but we need to be robust in you know the ways in which we we tackle things that are difficult so there are there's um probably more questions than we will get to um but um as we've always tried to do before, that if there's more than we can get to during this time, we will try and invite the panellists to respond after the event. But there's um, a couple relating to um, different churches' stances within Methodism around around this, and you've mentioned the, free, the importance of freedom of conscience before. So um, do you have any wisdom um, on how we might move forward with churches and ministers who differ in their views? For example, a minister who's in favour, but a chapel who is not. I think with a lot of grace. And I think I try to start, you know, uh, I've had a few people be in touch with me for advice about some of these situations. Um, and it's actually really hard to say we've all got to learn to respect each other's views, even when we don't agree with them. Um, and so in that situation, that's like, you know, the church needs to be able to respect the minister's view and vice versa. Um, and I think it's a it's a process of actually being open and being honest with each other um, <laughs> about 
living with that pain of you know, the minister would like to be able to um, preside at marriages, not just of heterosexual people in that church. The church is not happy with that. Um, they can't stop the minister doing that anywhere else. They can decide what happens in their own building. Um, and there is a tension in there that there is no easy way out of, I think. And part of this process will be living forward with that and trying to be as kind and as gracious to each other in it we can and that's not always easy particularly because some do try and throw rocks metaphorically um, in those conversations which makes it even harder yeah i mean there is an obligation if if for con reasons of conscience you you can't um uh, pres preside at that this at that sort of ceremony you must refer to somebody who can so that there, there is a an obligation in that way isn't the mark well, there's an obligation to notify, and then it's the district chair's yes. responsibility to um, make ref referrals. Um, mm. it's the subtlety of that particular process. <laughs> but yeah, in the in the question there, I think though we were we were a minister who was in favour in a church who didn't want to register their building. So, mm. um, there, that's you know, yeah, absolutely, you would signpost them, and you might kind of hopefully there'll be another church locally that could. Um, but yeah, it's tough. So there's a question that's um, kind of related, really. Um, um, so the um, Augur um, asks about if marriage is, is protected as between one man and one woman, then that has implications. So if conference defends the right of local Methodist churches to say we take that view so we won't have our building registered, does it also defend those churches' right to say a couple to a couple, in our view, you aren't or can't be married in the sight of God? I think defence is a is a strong term here. I think we have to recognise that what the conference has done <laughs> is given is allowed is said that these are legitimate views for Methodists to hold that marriage is between only one man and one woman, or that marriage is between only two people. So the church is within its rights in what we've passed to hold that same sex couples are not married as such. Um, and in a sense, that's not different from how it's been before the decision, in that. You know, there are many Methodist people who were married in either in other churches or in civil ceremonies beforehand. Uh, but we do also have a connectional definition of homophobia. So in some ways, it will depend how they go about doing that, um, because you know, if that, you know, if they're actually, um, you know, if they go out of their way to be offensive to this particular couple and tell them you're not actually married, are you, and all that sort of thing, it seems to me they're very likely to fall foul of the connectional guidance on homophobia, um, which, and incidentally, that ties back into um, some other things we were talking about earlier, um, um, in which case there could be complaints brought and um, action taken about actually how do you deal with people, because there is no excuse in any of this while we accept people's different views and people can hold their views, there's no excuse for treat for not treating anyone with respect. Mm. Um, and I think for me, that's what this would ultimately come back to, to say the conference, I think, expects Methodists to treat everyone with respect, whether or not they agree with their views. Um, you've mentioned before about um, Methodist church partnerships with other Christians, um, particularly the Church of England. Um, there are several questions um, perhaps inevitably, about where the Church in England is in the world with this at the moment. Um, currently debating resources around identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage. So what um, advice might you give? And is the Church of England missing anything in its process? I think one very significant difference for us as Methodists is that our um, sisters and brothers <clears throat> and uh, siblings across the world in uh, in other conferences are independent so that they're able to we are able to make a decision f for um the methodist church in britain uh, which is not the same decision that would be made for the methodist church in ghana or no. you know wherever whereas the anglican communion has a has a different structure which which makes that more the decision making more complex um and whilst we have i mean we have more methodists in the world than, than there are anglicans um she says <laughs> um we we have independent conferences and and the anglican communion has a more uh, uh 
I don't know how to describe it really, but a more complex uh, relationship um, with, with Canterbury. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think that puts the Church of England in a particularly difficult position and probably a more difficult one than say the Church in Wales or the Scottish Episcopal Church that don't have that kind of historic um, position at the, the so-called centre of the communion. Um, I think there's also um, a significant difference in the way the General Synod itself works. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about this evening is the tw conference in 2018, where we moved with a set of proposals from the floor, which are relatively similar in broad terms to what we've actually now passed. Um, and there was a procedural move to actually stop that happening. But I think it did very much show that probably the will was there in the conference to make this change. Um, and I think that then concentrated minds of some of those in authority that meant we then got a slightly more official way of doing that than, than a move just from the floor of conference. Whereas um, because of the different way the General Synod works and votes in houses so that, you know, you have to win in bishops and clergy and laity all at once. Um, sorry, win is probably not the best language, but the vote has to pass in all of those. Um, uh, yeah, that makes it much more difficult because you've got to whatever you want to try and do has got to pass the house of bishops um and with the the, the the strong line that seems to be being held there sadly that does make i think it very difficult um i suppose one other thing i would say is that living in love and faith is just a discussion thing and the difference with us is we've always had proposals on the end of something so there's always been a kind of case of do you you know would you want this action or not or would you change it um and i think the the struggle i think i would have with living in love and faith where i'm anglican or i in the church of england sorry um is about well what are we actually talking about you know if i if i engage with this and and talk about it where's it going and and then i'll be watching with interest and hope and prayer to see what what gets brought to the synod in due course and, and i think i mean the other thing is it just take mm. it's taken us an awful long time as well <laughs> uh, and and so we you know we we may feel that we're in a, good, a better place right now but goodness me it's been tortuous and it's been long term and there's been times when we haven't even been able to talk with each other about these things so i suppose it's about perseverance and um and tenacity uh, and yeah keeping going yeah i think all of those are really great things and um, there's a, a question that we discussed in preparing for this. So what do you think um, the Methodist church decisions might mean for um, open table communities? So if we have um, one that's hosted in a Methodist church and others have been watching the process with interest, there, there are Methodists across the network, even though there's only one host church. What do you think the Methodist process might mean for them now? Well, at one level, I really hope if there are folks in um, open table communities who are wanting to get married, that there are more possibilities for them. And, and ideally, if uh, some of those are in churches that host open table communities, that would be brilliant. And I hope it kind of, I, I don't know quite how to put this, but I hope it also sort of highlights that open table is is church. And, you know, which I, you know, I certainly thought that anyway to start with. But it, you know it's kind of it's it's not just something out there actually this is church as much as any of the rest of us and actually as these kind of decisions and this kind of view of lgbtqi plus christians just becomes more quote normal um it moves us all more to the the mainstream which is not desperately where i want to be but actually i think it's probably a good thing in some ways i would say usual rather than normal i think normal the, that's brilliant thank you yeah, Kieran. normal, I really normal just that. is is just normal is a horrible word isn't it it's, it's just statistically common it's overrated yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know unusual is also a good thing to be it is it is um well friends thank you very much indeed it's been fascinating and um uh there are more questions than we could get to, and there's so much uh, in, engagement in the chat. It's been uh, it's been brilliant. Um, so thank you for your insight and your openness and your vulnerability and putting yourselves out there to be asked some quite deep questions. We uh, can't see everybody. We can just I can see myself, Mark, and you, Kieran, and not not everybody on gallery view. But um, just personally, to say thank you to the Open Table Network. And, and for 
for all of you, for your witness, for your faith, for your faithfulness, and and for all that you do and are um, in relation, you know, to to our journey of faith. I just wanted to say that too. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so th thanks very much to you both, and also thank you all for joining us and for your questions. If you've been affected by anything you've heard, then please do reach out and seek support. We are here for you. We are happy to help and to point you in the right direction. If we don't know the answer, we may well know someone who does. We're looking forward to Black History Month in October. Um, our next LGBT Q&A will be with Open Table Network trustee, the Reverend Augustine Tanner Heim, who's an openly gay African-American activist, writer and speaker. Now, he recently trained for Anglican Ministry and he's now a curate at St. James and Emmanuel in Manchester, which hosts Didsbury Pride. Yes, that's right, a church which hosts a Pride event, um, which is a fascinating story in itself. Um, he's also a doctoral student in leadership, culture and practical theology. And he was also the winner of the 2020 Church Times Theology Slam competition. So it's great to have him on board as part of the leadership of the Open Table Network. He'll be talking to the Reverend G.D. McCauley, who's the founder and CEO of the House of Rainbow, which began 15 years ago to meet the needs of black African people who are LGBT and Christian. G.D.'s work of reconciling faith and sexuality has expanded to include counselling and pastoral support and human rights advocacy. He's openly gay, a British Nigerian, uh, born in London, and he's been a Christian minister for more than 20 years. And he's now an Anglican priest in East Ham in London. Um, G Day is an inspirational speaker, uh, author, pastor, preacher, and HIV activist um, with a master's in theology. In somebody, you, some of you may have seen him on TV. He presented the BBC documentary "Too Gay for God" in 2019, which examined church teaching on sexuality and marriage. And in 2021, he was nominated in the British LGBT Awards Outstanding Contribution for LGBT Life. So that's on Thursday, the 21st of October, 7 to 8 p.m. So as we draw to a close, if you value what we're offering here, um, if you appreciate the Ministry of Open Table Network, I might just uh, invite you to consider how you might support us. That could be through prayer. Um, it could be in volunteering in some way. It could be in giving from what you are able to give. Um, we're grateful for all that you bring to the network. Uh, we're richer for having you as part of it. So thank you so much again to Mark, to Barbara, to all of you. And we look forward to welcoming you again very soon. Good night. God bless and go well. <laughs>